If you're a regular listener, you've heard me warn about the dangers of IoT or Internet of Things. These are otherwise known as smart or connected devices. These are the things such as your smart speakers, toys, games, wearables, things that are connected to the Internet. And while these devices might add convenience to our lives, that often comes at the price of our privacy. So how do you know what information a connected device is harvesting and how is it used or sold? Are some devices better, meaning respect your privacy than others? Well, recently I discovered a website that's done all the work for you. So you can make an informed decision before buying one of these devices. If you like the convenience of connected devices, but you also respect your privacy, this episode is for you. Welcome to the Privacy Mentor Podcast, your partner in the fight against identity theft, fraud, and cyber threats. I'm your host, Carrie Kursky. Welcome to episode 71 of the Privacy Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Carrie Kursky. If you enjoy the conveniences of using smart or connected devices, but you're concerned about privacy, this episode's for you. Today, I'm joined by my special guest, Jen Kultrider. Did I say that right, Jen? It's Kultrider. Kultrider, yeah. Okay, perfect. I apologize. (laughs) Jen is the creator and lead of Mozilla's Privacy Not Included Guide, who works alongside a wonderful researcher, Misha, and Jen reads and tries to understand privacy policies from atop a mountain in Colorado, where she lives with her wife, four dogs, and one cat. And one of her biggest pet peeves, and mine is too, is a privacy researcher is companies who write extremely vague privacy policies that tell users nothing and give lawyers all sorts of wiggle room to do whatever they want with other people's personal information. Jen, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I'm happy to talk privacy. Yeah, and I I love it in your bio about your biggest pet peeve is how the attorneys and the terms of service and privacy policies, and it's all written in legal jargon, and it's 20 pages long, and they do that, so nobody will read them. (laughs) So I Yeah, they, 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 they do like to make it hard on us, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and talk about Privacy Not Included. So what is Privacy Not Included website, and why was it created? Uh, well, I work for Mozilla, and so back in 2017, Mozilla, who which is best known for making the browser Firefox, um, but is also maybe not well as well known. We're we're a nonprofit. We're a a, 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 a for good company. We, we're mission based. We aren't profit based. And back in 2017, we saw the rise of these connected devices kind of coming into people's lives and coming into people's homes, from the smart speakers to the fitness trackers to the surveillance cameras, and on and on and on. And, you know, we care about privacy at Mozilla a lot. And as we were looking around trying to figure out what what can consumers do to protect their privacy in our ever more connected world, um, we thought, well, they just, you know, how do they know what's good and what's bad? You know, there were plenty of review sites out there like Consumer Reports and CNET and, and places like that would review products for features and reliability and things like that, but nobody was looking at the privacy and security. And so um, we had a harebrained idea, well, let's make a buyer's guide about to review products on privacy and security. And we weren't sure we could do it because we're not a consumer review. Um, we weren't at the time a consumer review uh, organization. Uh, we were you know, a, a tech company, um, nonprofit tech company with a, a mission. And so, uh, I actually found somebody who worked um, at Mozilla who was looking into this sort of stuff and we teamed up. And so in 2017, we did our first privacy not included buyer's guide. It had like 48 products and and we we were very factual. You know, we didn't get very opinionated and we were just curious mostly to see if anybody cared. And after we launched our first guide, people did care. And we were like, oh, okay, we got something here. And so we've been making privacy not included ever since. So our biggest guide comes out in November is a holiday shopping guide. Um, but throughout the year, we also try and review things. We've done Valentine's guides in the past where we reviewed dating apps and sex toys. Um, we've done, uh, with the start of the pandemic, we reviewed video call apps um, when everybody was suddenly on Zoom. Um, and most recently, we reviewed mental health apps uh, because May is Mental Health Awareness Month and the world's in a mental health crisis. So it seemed relevant. Yeah. And I, my next question I was going to ask you, because my listeners know and they know me well, that I always say, if something is for free, then that means you're the product. So I was going to ask you, what is your business model? But you've already explained it. You're a nonprofit, which I think is phenomenal. So you work off of donations. 
Yeah, we're a nonprofit. We, um, you know, the Mozilla Foundation, uh, you know, you can go to our website and read about our funding better than I can. But yeah, um, the Mozilla Foundation owns the Mozilla Corporation. I work for the foundation. We're a nonprofit. Um, you know, the corporation is known for making Firefox and, and they make some money, you know, through partnerships like with Google and things like that. But most of my work uh, is, is, or the, the, I think I think most of my work, I'm not sure the exact breakdown, is funded by donations from grassroots people um, who who have five bucks to give, and and you know, and we're a small team, we're a team of two, so it's not like we're a huge a huge team out here reviewing all these products, but we're a team of two, my partner Misha and I, and and yeah, we do this for the for the the good of the world. Um, you know, that's our Mozilla has a mission to, to for a free and open internet that works for everyone, and that's. That's what I why I do what I do, not to make money. Um, I mean, I get paid a salary, which is right. Nice, you gotta, but, gotta put food on um, the table. But we, <laughs> yeah, but we aren't doing it to to make a profit. We're doing it to make the world better. Yeah, and I I think that's that's fantastic. And Mozilla, like you said, Firefox, that's my browser of choice that I've used for many years. You know, I mean, I, I always you always have to switch between two of them depending on what you're doing. Some things work better on ones than other, but yeah, on, on everything that's that's usually my default, my go-to. Um, used it for years, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. So thank you for that. We'll have to get have to get the y'all back on to talk about that as well. <laughs> So let's yes. talk a little bit more about privacy not included. So I see that the website, because you do these reviews, but it's not just limited to devices. You also review apps, like you mentioned with the mental health apps. So what made you want to expand from just devices into the app area? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's really interesting because we started off reviewing devices and you know we review like I said everything from fitness trackers to pet cams to smart speakers to your connected you know fitness equipment and and you know devices are in some way easier to review for privacy because you know you're looking at a device you know the company has a privacy policy and usually that privacy policy will apply to their website and their app and their device and all this and then you you know you kind of look in and and trying to figure out okay what's what data is being collected how's it being used um you know, and, and, you know, your, your fitness tracker collects a fair amount of data. Um, but when you get into the app realm, though, now you're talking about a whole nother world, a, a whole nother world of privacy, because, you know, a lot of these apps, they're a company in and of themselves. So, you know, Grindr is a company, it's a dating app, you know, but it's a company and, and they have, you know, a, a whole bunch of privacy concerns as, as for their business business practices through the app. And, and you tend to share a lot more data with an app than you necessarily might with a, with a device. You know, your, your dating app's going to ask for all kinds of personal information and location-based information. Your mental health app obviously asks for tons of that sort of information. And so um, we kind of, you know, we started off, you know, the hol our holiday guide we put out in November is our big one, and that's mostly devices. But we also kind of recognize, you know, there's just a lot of questions that consumers have. And, and it's our job to kind of help them understand you know, what questions to ask, what they should be concerned about, what they can kind of let go, because it's very confusing, this world of privacy. So for us, it's just very important to kind of keep putting good information out in the world that's going to help consumers understand how, how their privacy is being tracked, how it's being violated, what they can do about it from both the device perspective and from the app perspective. Yeah, and I really like how, how you, you brought that up, is that when people are using apps, I think they tend to forget what they're sharing their information with because they're just thinking it's a form of communication or it helps them get from you know point a to point b and meet their objective but they're forgetting that it's on an app meaning it's being stored somewhere all that information and what is someone doing with it and and i just think because technology has become become so ingrained in our lives that it's just a part of us now and we tend to forget where it's connected to and where that information is going so I, I, yeah, I love yeah. the and fact so that, much information. <laughs> hey, yo, the way if people had any really any idea, I think we would all be going off grid because <laughs> it, it is yes. pretty bad. Um, so one thing that I really like and your website is so user friendly because I've seen other ones not quite in along the lines of this, but other review sites and they're so hard to figure out let alone to find out you know, what to the product or, or the app that you're looking for to review it or to read the review. But then once you read the review, you're like, I don't even understand what that means. But you guys made it so easy. And the thing that I love 
is on the actual reviews, like when you're looking at the page, let's say you want to look at apps, they um, have, will list the different apps and they'll have, some of them have a little yellow triangle, like a little caution flag. What does that mean? We actually have what we call our privacy not included warning label um, that we put on apps that we've determined through our criteria. And, and, and if, you, if you're curious about our review criteria, you can go to our about page and, and look at our methodology if you really want to get nerdy. Um, but we review apps on in three areas. We review them on security. And in security, we have our minimum security standards. And our minimum security standards are five things that we think every product that's on the market should meet in order to be on the market. And if it doesn't meet those minimum security standards, we don't think anybody should use it. Um, and so those th that includes, does the product use encryption? Does it require a strong password? Um, does it have a way to push security updates if there's a, a security flaw? Does it have a way to manage security vulnerabilities? If, if, if one is found, is there a way to report it and for the company to find out? And finally, does it have a privacy policy? And so we look at those and if, and if, if a company doesn't meet our minimum security standards, they immediately get our privacy not included warning label. And then we look at the privacy um, of, of, of the devices and apps. And we look at things like, well, what, what, what level of information does this co collect? Does it collect a lot of personal information? Does it collect a little? Um, and how does the company use that data? Do they, do they just collect it to provide the service or do they collect it to, you know, use it as a business asset to you to do targeted advertising to try and sell you more stuff to um to do a lot of personalization to keep you on the app to keep you on the app longer and addicted to it do they sell your personal information do they take your personal information and collect more information about you from third-party sources like public sources or social media or data brokers to create an even bigger profile on you um, and then and then we look at what control does a user have over their data and that means you do you as a user have the right to access your data to request deletion of your data how long can you determine a, a company retains your data um, and and that's that's an important one for us and then thirdly we look at what's the company's known track record for protecting user data and I call this kind of my Facebook test because yeah Facebook will meet our minimum security standards they have a lot of engineers and people to to, to to do security for Facebook, but they have a terrible track record at collecting a lot of personal information and then respecting and protecting that information. And so, you know, if, if a company earns two dings on our privacy um, uh, criteria, then they also get the privacy not included warning label. We also started last year looking at AI and like, does a, does a product use AI? If, if the product uses AI, can the user determine how how the what choices the AI is making about them? Do they have any control over that? Is there any transparency in that um, to determine if there's bias that could be um, entering in your AI? And that one's something that we've just started looking at, so that doesn't really play into our warning label yet. But it, it's something that you know we at Mozilla really care about because AI is starting to make a lot of choices for us in the world, and it's not always clear what those choices are, if there's bias in those choices, if, if users have any control over those. So that's kind of how our privacy not included warning label works. And it's just, if you see that warning label on there, it means that we have concerns about your privacy with this product. And it's not, we're not saying don't use it. We're saying do a risk assessment for yourself. You know, I, I own a number of connected products. I, I have a fitness tracker. Um, I decided to go with a Garmin fitness tracker because I felt better about how they protected privacy over say a Fitbit um, or Amazon's fitness trackers, for example. And so just doing a little privacy um, risk assessment based on, you know, what do I feel comfortable with? Is this asking for more personal information than I like to share? Do they have a really crappy track record? You know, they, they, they you know, we reviewed a company in our mental health apps recently that, um, had exposed the, they had 10 million of their users' personal information files sitting on an Amazon cloud server that was exposed. Oh and my. when security researchers tried to reach out and let them know, hey, this is, these are exposed. We can see all this information. The company ignored them. And the, the researchers finally was, were able to go to Amazon and say, you got this information sitting on your cloud exposed. And it was Amazon that actually locked the information down, not the company. Wow. So that's not a company I would trust with my personal information. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and again, average person is never going to see that because they're not looking at it. So it's, you know, we're, we're grateful that organizations like yours are out there that can help keep an eye on this because technology in itself is not bad or evil. It's just how it's used. So 
you know, that's oh, yeah, why, sure. with, you know, with looking into this stuff, I, I think it's phenomenal what, what you guys are doing it and you make it so easy. The other thing I love about on the reviews right up at the top, it starts with a description about whether it's a device, you know, an app, a little bit description about it. And then the next section is what could happen if something goes wrong? I love this section because I've been working with identity theft and fraud victims for more than 15 years. And all the data breaches that have happened over the years, there's so much personal information available online that now you can buy anyone's name, address, date of birth and social for about 25 cents. I mean, it's basic, you know, supply and demand. So by understanding what information they have about you and if something should go wrong, what is going to be exposed? So that that is a section that was like speaking right to my heart because that is a, a big issue that we see happening with people. So talk more about that and, and why you decided to put that in there. Well, my goal has, since I started Privacy Not Included, has always been to make this accessible to average people because it is really confusing. And, and I'm kind of an average person myself who just fell into becoming a privacy researcher. And we approach all our research from the consumer perspective. You know, Privacy Not Included looks at, at publicly available information. What can, what can we find, you know, because we don't have the resources to buy the products and do the testing. We just like, what can we find and, and let people know before they buy the product? And and so it's, it's important to me that I try and make this as accessible as possible. And, and I still, I feel like I constantly have work to do to do that. And, and, and me trying to make things accessible always runs into what lawyers are comfortable with me saying, but, right. um, but just trying <laughs> to understand lawyers. like, yeah, it's like, Hey, this, this product collects a lot of personal information. You know, they're going to collect not just your name and your email address, but your location data and, and, and not just your usage data, but they're going to ask some intimate questions about your, you know, your, your mental health state or your sexual I identity or gender identity or, or, you know, things like that. And that's information that they have. Um, and, and you have to trust them with that. And so, and then looking and then kind of playing through some scenarios of like, okay, so they have all this information and they say that they can share it, or they have this track record of not protecting it. And that means that, you know, and then I, on a number of the reviews, I try and play out a little fun scenario. When I first started, they were really goofy scenarios, like, you know, connected toothbrush, like what's the worst that could happen? Well, probably you're not going to get spied on, but somebody could know what time you brush your teeth every night, <laughs> which could let them know you know, when you're home and then mm -hmm. your, your house could get broken into. And now, now we're into a world where so much more personal information is out there that now it's like, well, Hey, now, you know, Facebook could possibly know that, you know, you use an online therapy app, you meet with a therapist three times a week. You, maybe they could know that you meet with a therapist that specializes in OCD. Um, and based on that information, you know, some really bad people can also know that your, your age, your location, you know, your work status and, and target you with, with ideological beliefs that are pretty, pretty bad. And so now we're talking about manipulating people at a level that's way beyond, you know, the toothbrush, letting somebody know your home and what time you brush your teeth. And so, yeah, kind of playing out those, what's the worst that could happen, um, is just my goal of trying to help people understand what risks they're taking by, by getting this product or app. Yeah. And, and you bring up such a great point that, again, you know, people don't think about this. I mean, I, I know they have these smart dishwashers. This is one I still can't wrap my brain around. A smart dishwasher, because you're putting the dish in the dishwasher, you're closing the door, and then you take your phone out to start it, even though there's a button right there. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes I, I think people just go for the cool factor or the convenience factor, and they're not taking into account what risks can be associated with that. It's like not even on their radar. A, a friend of mine, he does IT work and he got a call from one of his clients and it was in the evening, of course it was dark. And the guy's calling him going, you have to come over right now. I can't turn my lights on in my house. And he's like, there's a switch on the wall that you, you, know, you can do for right now. So this technology, we're just being so so immersed with it. It's like, we, we no longer have critical thinking skills. And the furthest thing from our mind is that, well, it's like you said, it's just a toothbrush. What, what harm can it do? But when you really start breaking it down, it, they can do a lot of harm. And even though companies will say that they, I, the information they sell or share is de-identified, well, it's really easy to figure out who it is just by looking at a couple of parameters. So that whole de-identification thing is just, I think, a, a marketing ploy or a gimmick just to make it sound, make you feel better. 
So I think it's great. Now, another thing that I saw on the website that I thought was great was the creepometer. Let's talk about the creepometer. Yeah, well, 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 privacy not included has two goals. One is to help consumers make smart decisions when they're shopping to protect their privacy. The other goal we have is we think companies put way too much responsibility on the user for their own privacy protection. You know, you could spend hours every day going through privacy um, settings and, and trying to lock them down only to have them change the next week and you need to go back in. And so one of the things that we wanted, wanted to do when we first started Privacy Not Included was show that companies care and that consumers will buy products, you know, that, that, that they feel more comfortable with from a privacy perspective and, and not others. And so we added the creep meter is a way for users to go in and say, okay, here's, here's our review. Um, you know, we're not going to tell you whether to buy or not, but here's our review. But how creepy do you think this is? And people can then indicate, oh, I think this product's really creepy. I don't think this one's so creepy. And it's just a way to, for consumers to show companies, hey, this, your product's creeping me out. I don't like that. But also when you land on our, when you, if you go to privacynotincluded.org and you land on the main page and you start scrolling through, it ranks the, the least creepy products at the top. And then as you scroll down, you get to the most creepy products at the bottom. And so it's kind of a nice way for consumers to show companies, you know, hey, your product creeps me out. And so I'm going to bury it. I want people to see the, the least creepy products first. Um, and, and so it, it's nice to have that kind of feedback that, that we can see and that com can companies can see. Plus, it's fun. It's cute. Cute. Exactly. Yeah, I, I thought that was I thought that was that was a great idea. Um, and again, you're you're telling the companies because you know you could be out there all day long saying here's all the stuff, and then consumers obviously you know uh, speak with their with their wallets. But by having that, it's an extra thing. So a company can go to the website and see if their product's on it. And if you know, if I had a product on there and it was labeled super creepy, I would be concerned. So <laughs> and maybe it's a way yeah. we could finally start getting these companies to, you know, can put make be privacy forward as opposed to being an, an afterthought. Um, so let's go back. You talked about, you know, with reviewing the apps and about the uh, mental health apps. I know you recently came out with a report um, and you talked about it a little bit. Let's get into that a little bit more about that report and, and how it could really, you know, do some damage to users. Yeah, mental health apps. Uh, you know, my partner, Misha, and I reviewed these, um, you know, starting in the spring or a couple of months ago this year. And and, you know, we, we first had the idea because when you look around the world, everybody's mental health is, is at a crisis right now. And, and you know, if, if, if you know anything about Silicon Valley and, and the big tech, they know, you know that they love a crisis. Um, it's a money-making opportunity for them. And, you know, we saw this with video call apps at the beginning of the pandemic when everybody was suddenly using them and, and they were growing super rapidly and, and they kind of they grew too fast to, con to to think about privacy and security sometimes. And so, you know, we were kind of the people that was like, hey, as you're growing really fast, maybe stop and consider some privacy concerns because, you know, this is important. And so we were seeing something similar with mental health apps. People, there's a mental health crisis. These mental health apps have popped up. And in some cases, they're really they're really useful, right? People are having a hard time finding therapists. They can't access them in their area. They're booked out. Um, they can't afford them. And these can provide access to therapists that they might not have other, otherwise have. It can, can provide useful tools to monitor symptoms, um, to, to help with moods, um, to you know meditate, to try and feel better, to manage stress and anxiety. So I don't want to take away from the fact that mental health apps are needed right now. What I do want to say is it's really scary when you see profit coming before people's vulnerable people's um, personal concerns. And so um, when we, we reviewed 32 mental health apps um, and what we found was this was the scariest, creepiest product of cat category that we have ever reviewed um, in part because they collect so much incredible personal information on the users. And, and you, know, you know, we reviewed dating apps last year and those collect a lot of personal information. Mental health apps, it's another level because you're targeting people at their most vulnerable. You're asking questions, not just about personal identifying questions like where you live and, and your name and your email address and things like that. But you're also asking people to share information about um, you know, how they're feeling, their moods, are they depressed? Are they feeling anxious? You know, how are your OCD symptoms today? Are you having suicidal thoughts? What medications are you on? Um, how frequently are you seeing a therapist? And so we're getting into a whole nother level of personal information. And from my perspective, 
that personal information should be protected at all costs. And, and, and there's this interesting, you know, in the US we have HIPAA laws that protect medical information. Um, but we found there's this interesting like space where kind of HIPAA ends and the data economy begins. And, and that's where companies see the profit. And so, you know, if I'm, if I'm using an app like BetterHelp and I'm seeing an online therapist, my conversations with those therapists that I have online are going to be protected by HIPAA. Um, and the contents of those are going to be protected, which is great, as they should be. But perhaps the fact that I'm having a conversation with, with that therapist, that I'm using the BetterHelp app, how often I'm using the BetterHelp app, um, you know, where I might be using this app, those things aren't protected by HIPAA. Those things are, are information that these companies can often use and collect and then use for things like targeted advertising um, or, or, or other ways to make money. You know, they, a lot of these, well, some of these companies will say in their, in their privacy policies, hey, this, your personal information is a business asset for us. And, and that's where it started to get really scary for us. And then the second thing that, that really concerned us with these apps is, you know, a lot of them are, they're, they're relatively new. They're getting a lot of investment dollars, um, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars were invested in these companies last year. So they're growing really quickly. And, you know, when you're growing really quickly and you're getting all this venture capital funding, you need to show growth and that's the priority. But that means that privacy and security might not be as big a priority. And so, for example, um, we couldn't determine a, a number of these companies. We just couldn't determine if they met our minimum security standards. One, because they just don't have public documentation on that. You know, Google, you know, love or hate Google, like they have a lot of public documentation that you could go in and read about how they handle privacy and how they handle security. Um, these companies don't. They don't, wow. they don't talk about their use of encryption. They don't talk about, you know, a number of these apps just allowed really weak passwords. One app we were able to log in with one one as a password. Wow. Um, a number of them we were able to get in with six ones or eight ones or something like that. And so I, the other thing that was really telling for us is we, e as part of our research, we emailed the, the uh, email address or the contact information listed in the company's privacy policy for privacy related questions. Sometimes it's also the address that users use to access and delete data, make requests like that. We emailed 32 apps from 31 companies. Of the 31 companies that we emailed, we each emailed each company three times over about a month and a half. Um, one company got back to us after our first email, about a week after our first email, Halo, the Catholic prayer app Halo, good for them, give them a shout out. Two companies got back to us within the range of by, by our third email. So only three companies actually responded to our wow. questions uh, about their companies from the private email listed in their privacy policy. The other ones, a lot of these companies didn't respond to us until we'd published our research and the media had reached out to them. And then they started scrambling and they're like, oh, oh yeah. we didn't know you reached out to us. And, and some of the excuses we got from companies not responding to our emails was one company said, oh, the person that monitors that email left in March and we haven't replaced them, which isn't like you know, for a company that claims they care about your privacy, like it seems like a low bar to have somebody monitoring that, that privacy email. Another company said, oh, it, it, you know, you're because you're a researcher, your email got flagged as spam and we missed it. Um, and so there were just a number of concerns about, you know, rapidly growing companies, a lot of investment, but not kind of keeping pace with privacy and security concerns. And so when you're collecting this much personal information, um, it, you know, you should, A, you should protect it even better than any other thing that we've ever reviewed. And, you know, you know, if I, if I go, I just bought a drum set and I was like, I want to learn how to drum, um, you know, and I was looking for a drumming app to teach me. And I, you know, did my search and I found what Google recommended. And I went to the app store to read about it and look at the privacy information. And the one I landed on, I was reading the privacy policy for this drumming app. And it struck me at how similar the privacy policy for the drumming app looked to the privacy policy of the mental health apps. And, you know, they all, collect some personal information, um, mental health apps probably collect a lot more, but then they can use it for targeted interest-based advertising. They could share it with third parties, um, you know, things like this. And I, and I was like, it struck me that like the, the privacy policy for the drumming app that I'm going to use to learn drumming should not look at all like the privacy policy for the mental health app that I'm using to manage my mental disorder or suicidal thoughts or depression. And 
And, you know, and so it's just like these companies need to do better. And the kind of standard norm data economy privacy policies where we collect a bunch of information, we use it as, as a business asset to market and target and make more money just feels really icky. Yeah, and that's that's absolutely shocking. Um, and, and I agree with you 100%. You know, it is such a sensitive subject. And it's amazing how technology is created this gray area between a lot of the federal regulations around what's protected and what's not. And it just seems when once it becomes in, you know, to the internet and it's online, then it morphs and it's like, well, it's not really subject to that because it looks different. And a lot of the laws when they were written, this type of technology didn't exist. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but the fact that you've reached out to 32 of these apps and only three of them responded, that speaks volumes. That speaks volumes. It, it really does. Yeah, it really um, does. It, it, if I may make a suggestion, if you haven't already have it on your target to review some of these financial apps, especially credit related apps, because there are a mm -hmm. lot of things. There was one, it's a big one that a lot of people use. And whenever I do speaking, that would be the one to be like, oh, what about this app? You know, because we talk about how to get the free credit reports. And um, so I made a comment about, you know, what the app does and what they do with your information. And I got an, an email later on from one of the attendees. And she's like, my son works there. And he said, everything you said was a lie. And I said, well, you know, maybe they changed it. You know, it's not like I've never been wrong before. <laughs> Let me look into it. So I went back to the website, reviewed their terms of service and privacy policy. And not only was what I said true, it was actually even worse now. And it said mm -hmm. that if you canceled your subscription with them, they still kept all of your information indefinitely. Now, this is a credit app that get access to credit reports. <laughs> and even though if you cancel it, they're still keeping it and they can do whatever they want with it. And I love how in these, these uh, privacy policies where they say, we don't sell your information, they say, we share your information. And then in order for someone to become a partner or a member of that organization, they have to pay to play. So it's a roundabout way of selling the information. It's just all in semantics. So, but yeah, that yeah. is, that is eye-opening about with these mental health apps, especially like you said, right now we're, we're in a crisis time and people need it. Um, and they might not be able to get access to it for one reason or another, you know, in person. So this was a great alternative. And they're unfortunately being taken advantage of by, by these organizations. And it's not that they're all intending to mislead people. I, I think, like you said, a lot of it, they're just building these things because they're trying to meet the market demand. And then later on, it's like, oh yeah, privacy. We didn't think about that. Let's, you know, it was like in the past when you build these apps, it's like, oh yeah, security. I think we might need to slap some of that on there. So yeah, let's, well, you guys keep fighting the good fight and hopefully more of these companies will become more privacy forward and uh, put uh, privacy in the forefront as opposed to being an, an afterthought. Um, so Jen, where can people go if they want to check out the website to you know, check and see if what they're using uh, has the, the, uh, the warning label or not, um, or also to look at this mental uh, health app guide, uh, where would they go? Yeah, I mean, it's real easy. PrivacyNotIncluded.org is the URL. It'll take you to our site. And then, you know, you can search around. We have categories like smart home and mental health apps and entertainment and toys and games and pets. Um, or And within those, subca there's subcategories trying to make it easy for you to find things. If you don't see what you want, you can also search for it. Um, and if, if you don't find it when you search for it, you can also drop me a line and, and put in a product request. We, we can't obviously review everything, but you know, if a number of people request uh, products, then we'll try and make sure we include those as, as we go forward. Um, I get product requests all the time. I've, I've had product requests recently for to review connected cars, which is really an interesting Oh, uh, that would area. be interesting. Um, uh, yeah, and, and reproductive health apps are a big one right now that a lot of people are very curious about with the um, recent news um, in that world. And so, yeah, just go to Privacy Not Included, check it out. You can leave comments. You can, you know, my email address is on there. If you if you have any questions, I try, try my best to respond to people. So, but yeah, just 
you know, go play around, share it with your friends and family. And then what I like to tell people is have these conversations about what you're comfortable with, you know, because I think about all the time what I'm comfortable with. And, and as you pointed out, I think a lot of people maybe don't think about that. And so stopping and just being like, well, what am I comfortable with? Am I comfortable sharing this information? Um, am I comfortable, you know, knowing that once I've shared it, I can't get it back? And it could be out there forever. Um, my favorite thing that I've learned from reading a bunch of privacy policies is, you know, every just about every privacy policy has some warning in it that says, you know, we can't guarantee the, the security of your information because nothing on the internet is 100% safe. Right. And I think that's good advice. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We always tell everybody when you think about privacy and convenience, picture it on a scale. Because the more you have of one, the less you have of the other. So like you said, know what the risks are um, and be willing to accept those risks in exchange for that convenience. And if you're not willing to accept those risks, then you know, might take you a little bit longer and you have to do it the old fashioned way, but at least your privacy will be protected. <laughs> Well, Jen, yes. thank you so much. It's a pleasure having you on the show. And I really appreciate everything that, that you guys are doing over there. I can't believe it's just a, a two man team. I mean, you guys are doing phenomenal things with just the two of you. So kudos to you and for helping to keep all of us informed and safe. And if you have not checked out Privacy Not Included, I suggest you go ahead and do it right now because your privacy will thank you. And if you haven't had a chance to subscribe to this podcast, Go ahead and take a minute, hit that subscribe or follow button. And if you like what you hear, leave me a review. It would really help me grow this show. That's it for today. And thanks so much. Join us again for another episode of Privacy Mentor Podcast. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Privacy Mentor. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, or anywhere else you listen to your favorite podcast shows. If you love the show, please share with your friends. And don't forget, give us a five-star review. For additional information, show transcriptions and notes, visit kursky.com forward slash podcast.